In this episode of Idea City, this is an eight foot squid. This animal is as big around as a 55 gallon drum, his eyes as big as your fist, and his wingspan is about four feet. He's a magnificent animal, completely unafraid of me. What he has in his uh, arms is a 25, 30 pound chunk of five foot squid that he just ripped it apart. And he's so confident that he comes up and shoves me right out of his way like a playground bully. And the armor that I'm wearing leaves a mark on his side. You can actually see where he touched me. But he's completely unafraid. That's when I realized this is a dinner and a movie. Idea City. The smartest people, the biggest ideas. So it turns out. It turns out that the undersea world's most intriguing predator is not one of the usual suspects. It's not the great white shark or the killer whale, but it is a powerful outsized squid that features, get this, eight snake-like arms lined with suckers full of nasty little teeth, a razor-sharp beak that can rapidly rip flesh into bite-sized chunks, and an unrelenting hunger. It's called the Humboldt, or Jumbo Squid, and it's not the sort of calamari you're used to forking off your dinner plate. This squid grows to seven feet or more, and perhaps a couple hundred pounds. It's uh, sometimes portrayed as the kind of outlaw biker of the marine world. Intelligent, opportunistic, a stone-cold cannibal willing to attack divers with seemingly deliberate hostility. Scott, is that a fair description? Great Scott place. Cassell. <laughs> nice to meet you. So, why are we here? We're the custodians of the earth. And what we give to our kids is largely dependent on what we're doing with it now. But we're finding that there are inherent problems with the earth, and we all can make changes. It all depends on if you have the courage inside to make these changes happen. So we all know that we have the global warming predictions and stuff like this, so we've all been contributors to that. But where do we stand right now? Well, this is my past. I, uh, I kind of have a... I guess you could call me a security guard. Um, I've done all kinds of interesting things that involve things that go boom and ships and, and uh, actually watching what happens when bad guys go bad. But I found, by the way, anybody know what that is on my back? Um, yeah, it goes boom. Um, the fact is, is that this right here, by the way, that's Shauna, my girlfriend right there. Um, she was helping me unearth a vaquita porpoise, which is the most rare mammal on the planet that was killed by poachers. I've actually hunted poachers with her and turned the information over to local authorities and arrests were made. So this is me in my office. I was actually inspired by 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, something that came from the media. And right after that picture was taken, the animal ripped off the voles my scalp and broke my wrist. I have a very strong beak. So um, this is a little bit about the squid. This is one of my favorite critters. The thing is, is that it's the Earth's resident alien, and I get to play with it. I consider myself very fortunate. Look at that eye. Now, don't forget, this is a mollusk. This is a snail relative. And with that beak right there, it's, uh, it's very formidable. And uh, inside of it is that gold spike-covered tongue. That is a full of basically chitin. It scrapes off flesh and throws it down the gullet. So it's a fantastic feeding machine. It, uh, this is what it looks like when it's trying to chew on your face. <laughs> so we all heard that, oh, they got 1,200 suction cup, but every suction cup has these teeth in them. These are the scars on my throat and on my back. But um, they, uh, they suction while they chew into you. So it's really quite the imaginative animal. And uh, there they are being used right there. So they have a heck of a grip. Chromatophores are fantastic. They speak and communicate to each other through changes in the, uh, both the color or saturation as well as the frequency of their, uh, of their flashes. And if you look at it, they can actually change color in 1 30th of a second. That's one frame of film. And every single chromatophore, which is 1.2 million of them, are wired directly to the brain. They bypass the central nervous system. These animals think their color, which is why some people suspect that communication is much more complex than we think. You see right there, that's called hemispherical shading. 
They do have a backbone in a sense. This is it. It looks like a Ziploc bag. It's called the new call cartilage or the pin. And right on the sides of their head, they had these ball and socket joints. They locked their head in place for high speed maneuvering in the water. Anybody who's ever fallen down while water skiing know the power of the water. Um, this right here is a cannibal chomping on an animal that I just caught, and he chewed through his head in 21 seconds. That's about as thick as most people's legs. These are two 150 pound squid fighting over a five foot squid they just ripped apart. They're incredibly fierce animals. Um, they ink to cover up things that they want to eat. They don't ink just because they're afraid. This ink right here is billowing ink, and it also has a toxin inside of it that makes you tingle. So not in a good way. Um, and so when they're fighting like this, if you find yourself inside of an ink cloud, you're going to get your butt kicked because they're going to come into the ink thinking that they can eat you. This is a pseudomorph fake body. And it is so effective that this squid thinks he's going to eat a wounded squid, and only at point-blank range does he realize that it's just an ink cloud. So they are visual predators. They acquire most of their prey by looking at it. They are very smart. They have problem-solving intelligence. This squid is on a jig, and he's being aggressed by two cannibals. And in order to get away from them, he comes and hides behind me. <laughs> you see the marks on his back from the chitinous ring teeth? I got some of those a few seconds after this shot was taken. This is an eight-foot squid. This animal's as big around as a 55-gallon drum. His eyes as big as your fist. And his wingspan is about four feet. He's a magnificent animal, completely unafraid of me. What he has in his uh, arms is a 25, 30-pound chunk of five-foot squid that he just ripped it apart. And he's so confident that he comes up and shoves me right out of his way like a playground bully. And the armor that I'm wearing leaves a mark on his side. You can actually see where he touched me. But he's completely unafraid. That's when I realized this is a dinner and a movie. <laughs> so he's cruising around, realizing that he's in charge. And I'll tell you what, guys, it's an amazing feeling to be your animal that knows he's in charge of you. It is a very cool feeling. Uh, no sharks have ever been able to give that to me. You got to dive with the squid, dude. Um, <laughs> but, now, the one on the right is an eight-footer. The one on the left is a six-footer. The difference between just two feet can be 100 pounds. So they are magnificent. Now, I wish we had audio, because right now I'm getting my butt kicked. You can see the... Turn it up, turn it up. Hear the clattering of the chitinous ring teeth? When we come back... This is what it looks like. For the first time in history, we're flying on the back of a giant squid species along with others, and we find out that they're extremely social. A single shoal of Humboldt squid can be 500,000 to a million animals. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. This right here, I'm putting a camera on the squiddies and I'm letting them, there's my uniform right there, just chainmail suit and rebreather and cables and because I'm tired of having things broken by the squid. And uh, so I let them go and I'm trying to find out what's the density of a shoal, how many squid travel together. How do you do that? By putting cameras on them, little critter cams. So I have a little Kevlar feed uh, cable, so we, we let them go. I've actually put these types of things on sharks and turtles and other animals like that. I'm happy. So this is what it looks like. For the first time in history, we're flying on the back of a giant squid species along with others, and we find out that they're extremely social. And you look at the density of these things, and now we realize that a single shoal of Humboldt squid can be 500,000 to a million animals. They don't travel alone, ever. And so the wonderful thing about visibility of the ocean, you just don't see the other ones that are right on the outside of the curtain, but they see you. Look at the density of them. How cool is that? Well, I'm a squid nerd, so that's cool, you know? <laughs> I do like women. <laughs> so here we are. We actually done endoscopic examination of live Humboldt squid. This is about a 100-pound animal. And uh, these are the chromatophores up close. Aren't they beautiful? They open and close like a little umbrella, but there's four layers of them. We just discovered this recently. And so... They're just magnificent. So here we are taking the endoscope and we're putting it in inside the mantle of this Humboldt squid. And I gotta tell you, if this is Earth's resident alien and we're probing him, that's one for us, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So you see right here, this blue blood is actually based on copper. Ours is iron-based, and it's, it's actually a cyanin-based blood. Right in the center is one of the hearts, and that white little curly thing is a fallopian tube. This is a female. These animals can have 20 million babies each. So we'll talk about that here in uno momento. But uh, you see there here, the uh, aorta is actually anchored to the back, just like our aorta is anchored to our spine. But we have three hearts with the Humboldt squid. And this right here is what we call the cathedral. This is the ligamentary structure that's actually anchoring the largest gills of any squid known, which means it's a very aerobic animal. It's a hunt down, grab you predator. There's one of the brachial hearts right there that pumps the deoxygenated blood to the gills. There it is, pounding away, just all happy. Well, not happy, I got a probe up him. But then there's the other heart right there. And so you can see the egg masses around it right there, those beautiful golden bronze eggs. These are the gill structures right there, and they are wonders to behold. You can actually see the blood traveling from being clear, from being deoxygenated to being clear, actually blue whenever it's oxygenated. This is the throat. This is peristalsal movement of swallowing. So guess where we are now? This is where poop is made. <laughs> or actually, this is the pyloric sphincter inside the stomach, and uh, that used to be a fish. And you see the color of this uh, uh, material inside of it, this water. There's the stomach as we're, we're actually extricating the equipment. And uh, you see that it's pleated very much like a human being. But this is reddish yellow from the hemoglobin, the red blood, of the animal that he's just digested. They digest things almost as fast as they can bite into it. They have an amazingly caustic system of digestion. That's why they have to eat every two hours. So they have a, a metabolism more similar to a hummingbird than anything. And the, uh, we've done dissolved oxygen studies on these things and found out that they use about as much oxygen as a hummingbird, pound for pound. This is coming out the throat. That's that beautiful spike-covered tongue. Pretty sexy, huh? So the failing of the Hague fishery in Chile was upon arrival of the Humboldt squid. And then, uh, just like I predicted 10 years ago, we're losing our salmon. If you guys like salmon on the West Coast, forget it. It's going to go extinct. And it's all because of the Humboldt squid. And why is it? Why are they populating this area? This is why. We have lost our shark population. We have an average of 3% of the population of the Pacific predators now. Um, and uh, that includes tunas and sharks. And right here, who's going to ever tell me that sharks don't eat squid now? There it is. So here's the epic battle between shark and giant squid. Evidence of this prey predator hierarchy. So if they're of equal size, the shark will usually win, but not always. I've seen a Humboldt squid attack a 14-foot thresher shark and take a bite that was about the size of an orange out of its head. And so, unfortunately for me, uh, I really worked hard to get that squid, and I jumped in the water to beat the shark up. And uh, when I got in there, Shauna saw the images, and she said, some of you are squid. So, but after I saw that it was a blue shark, which I love, I let him go. So, here we have the origin of the Humboldt squid, and look where they are today. Yellow is where they began, and red is where they are now. It's just a matter of time till they turn the horn and start coming up the Atlantic coast. We have a fire that's raging underwater right now. And so, what inspired me was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea when I was six years old, and now I've actually got to see some pretty cool stuff. This is on the back of a Humboldt squid, and that's a normal squid that's about 15 to 20 feet away. Remember that size right there. Now, from 25 feet away, which is what the little ring of lights can see, it'll be about 36 of visibility vertical and 48 feet horizontal. Remember that with what you're about to see. There's a giant squid coming in to attack my Humboldt squid. And if you realize that he's between 15 and 20 feet away, then his arms, tip to tip, are about 35 feet. He's 1,800-pound giant squid, and we've done this three times. But with limited visibility in a big animal, it's really hard to see the rest of them. Oh, well. When we come back... We are actually doing a five-year mission around the Earth looking for new species of life, and this program is open to every single scientist of every single discipline in the world. Great ideas are meant to be shared. Join the discussion on Facebook. Idea City. The smartest people, the biggest ideas. So... Here's the Undersea Voyager project. Why is it so important? Well, I like squid and its subs. I don't know if you know that or not. But um, 
Squid attacking the sub. Oh my God. Goes up to the surface by an umbilical. They're upset. They send it up to satellite to the school. <laughs> now, can you imagine how that's going to affect those kids besides the counseling they'll need that they just lost their, their, their teacher? But you can also imagine the inspiration about these kids are actually seeing somebody that they know and love that's inside the sub being attacked by a squid or seeing something really cool. So we have several missions right there, and we just did the Tahoe expedition. And uh, the next, of course, is we're going to the Maiden Undersea Voyage, which involves the Pacific Gyre, the largest plastic heap in the water in the world. And uh, we're going to film the reality of it, and we're going to be uh, producing some more work for Google, which is where most of my findings will be found. It will be on Google Ocean starting very soon. But uh, here we are in the Lake, uh, Lake Tahoe, which we just finished this. I literally just came from Tahoe to here. And uh, here's one of our little subs right there. Our mission is to involve the scientific community and give them access to the ocean. Not by ROV, so they can look at a TV screen. Anybody can do that. What we want to do is actually put people in the water. This is one of the primary reasons for Tahoe. There was a tsunami that happened there. And if you look at those little numbers clicking away, you'll find out that it was 104 meters tall, right? There. That's 300 plus feet high in a lake. That's cool. Now, by the way, over here, that's Sid. That's one of our youth ambassadors. I take 14-year-old kids that are, have an interest in science, and I train them how to be explorers and use the scientific method in the real world by making them submersible pilots. And we've actually had three kids in the water. The criteria is, of course, on selection is they have to be able to tell people what they saw, their peers, and what was it like to be a scientist? What was it like to be an explorer working alongside scientists? So here's me, and uh, that's actually Dr. Schweikert. We're about ready to part over the edge on these uh, earthquake, earthquake fault. But we also found these magnificent ancient trees that are several hundred feet deep. But the thing is, is that they're 2,000 years old, and they're perfect records of what the climate was like back then. And so if you do a core sample of these things and, and, and put that right next to the core sample of a current tree, you have an exact uh, information tool of how much oxygen is inside the air at the 2,000 years ago. What was the rain cycles like? And we can use that as a direct comparative as to where we're at now. And so these trees were fantastic. And it's a lot easier to get to them by sub, by the way. They're, they're deep. So we also found a new species of life, which I found is interesting. It's a species called a protist, which is uh, neither fungus, neither algae, or neither plant or animal. It's kind of everything. And uh, so it, they're going through a lot of fun with these things. And they look kind of creepy, but uh, hey, it's new. So. So we also do a lot of findings where uh, we wear orange when we're in the, uh, in the sub and we wear blue when we're on shore. Um, but uh, we do a lot of findings episodes. So here's the reality. If the oceans fail, so does our species. We do have to make a choice. And the choice is on our heels right now. We're finding that 71%, does this sound familiar? Her five-year mission is to seek out new life and knowledge and to boldly go where no one has gone before. But this time it's real. We are actually going a five-year mission around the Earth looking for new species of life. And this program is open to every single scientist of every single discipline in the world to apply to come on board. The question is, what do you want to learn about the oceans today? And what do you need to know to continue our species on? The reality is very scary. 71% of, of the world's oxygen capacity is in the oceans, that little green stuff that floats in there, phytoplanktons. And so with this chemical soup that's being created between man and these volcanoes underwater, it'll become so acidic, it'll become like Coca-Cola. And at that point, the vegetation in the oceans die, and 71% of the world's oxygen can be lost in a week when the chain reactions start to occur. I find that frightening. And some of the scientists that I've been discussing this with are saying 25 years is generous. Thank you very much for having me. Bravo, Scott. Thank I wanted you. to ask you, um, did, did, I, did I hear you correctly to say that each female squid is capable of millions of offspring? 20 million eggs. 20 yeah. each. Yeah, 20 but million do eggs. Do they actually do it, or they're yeah. capable of it? No, they, they've been having between 5 and 20 million eggs every cycle. How they often? Live, they how live often about two to say? five years. Nobody actually knows how long they live, which is one of the wonders of this animal. And the fact is, is that they live here in California now, all the way up to Alaska. Mm -hmm. They don't occur there. I found babies. Mm -hmm. 
So now they are resident animals there. Mm -hmm. And that's why the fall of the salmon is almost imminent. Because well, what's their cycle? How often do they reproduce? They reproduce once and then they die. Uh -huh. Only so. 20 million offspring. Yeah. Piece of cake. So my advice yeah. is eat all the calamari you want. Yes. <laughs> so stop eating tuna, stop eating sharks, eat the calamari. Right. So. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. <laughs> Five years has been really good for giant species. I mean, uh, some people actually got footage of uh, Morotuthus, which is uh, about a 16-foot giant squid species, and then I got pictures of the largest uh, uh, Humboldt squid in the world, 250 pounds, and then I also filmed the giant squid, which is about 1,800 pound squid. This is a great getup. Can you spin around so we can yeah, get to the sure. back? Well, that's my logo, and uh, that will happen. What's that? Giant squid attacking my sub. <laughs> that will happen. I guess we'll find out I soon enough. Yep, I got slated to happen next time. As long as the, the footage survives, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I like coming home to tell the stories.